If you go on to study civil engineering, you'll probably be required to take a dedicated statics course where you spend the whole course studying static equilibrium. Here we're just going to scratch the surface of that, but we'll be able to still learn the basic principles involved in how static equilibrium works, starting with the conditions for it, and then looking at some examples of static equilibrium. And we'll end with some stress and strain and material properties. First, the conditions for static equilibrium. A body's in equilibrium when the linear and angular acceleration are zero in some inertial reference frame. So when our acceleration is zero, we're in equilibrium. And we're in static equilibrium when it's at rest in our selected frame of reference, which we can choose how we'd like. Here, looking at Newton's laws of motion, we can see that from Newton's second law, sums of the forces equal to mass times acceleration, if our acceleration is zero, then that simplifies to the sums of the forces are equal to zero. Similarly, with the sums of the torques are equal to I alpha, if alpha is equal to zero in static equilibrium, then the sums of the torques are equal to zero. These are the conditions of static equilibrium. In some senses, this is a lot simpler than some of the motion stuff we've been doing because we can still draw our free body diagrams and sum our forces and sum our torques, but now rather than summing our forces and setting them equal to mass times acceleration, it's always gonna equal zero. And we can express this in x, y, z coordinates like this, where the sums of the forces in any direction you choose is gonna be zero, and the sums of the torques about any axis you choose is going to be zero. In two dimensions, which is what we're going to focus on, this simplifies further because we're going to generally work in the x, y plane, and we're going to have rotation only about an axis perpendicular to that plane. So we'll only have three equations that we can write, sums of the forces in the x and the y, and sums of the torques about some axis that's perpendicular to that plane. It's going to be important to find torques. And so we'll review torque is equal to R cross F, that's RF sine theta. And I think it helps to think about this in terms of, you can think about that RF sine theta as either being the perpendicular component of the force, which is what I'm going to draw in here, where that force can be broken down into a component that's parallel to our lever arm and then perpendicular to our lever arm. And so if you do F sine theta, that gives you the perpendicular component, and that's the part that's gonna try and make it spin. So RF sine theta, you can think about that giving you the perpendicular component of the force, or you can think about it giving you the perpendicular component of the lever arm, where our lever arm, if we use R sine theta, that'll give us that perpendicular component of the lever arm. So if you have R and F and theta, you can just plug it into RF sine theta, but this tells you that also if you have a perpendicular distance, you can just use that instead of finding the actual distance to the actual point of application of the force.